Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 30. My name is Lena Warwick, and I'm super excited to chat with Camila Pachon Silva about her journey today. Camila and her family were forced to flee from Colombia because of the intense drug wars that were happening during that time. They were able to seek asylum from the United States, and to their amazement, they received it. As a 16-year-old helping out her parents with the immigration process, she saw firsthand what the process looked like. Her journey to immigration led a spark in her heart to become an immigration attorney. She's now operated her firm for a little over three years now. She's a new mom and she's doing a fabulous job out there. You're going to absolutely love her journey. So let's dive right in. All right, Camila, thank you so, so much for coming on to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I truly appreciate your time and I'm really excited to hear all about your journey. So how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Alina. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk a little bit about your immigrant journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to the United States? Well, I'm originally from Colombia, from Bogota, Colombia. I moved to the States with my immediate family back in 2001. Um, and I moved here with my parents and my younger brother. And why did your parents decide to move? Well, around the time that I moved to the state, my country was going through a very difficult time, a very violent time. And my family, unfortunately, because of that same violence, was forced to flee. So we came to the United States and we were able to seek asylum. Wow. Wow. So and what was that journey like? I was very young. I mean, I was 16. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of immigrants will tell you that journey makes you mature pretty fast, makes you grow up very fast. I spoke a little bit of English and my parents spoke no English at all. So you become your parents' main help. So from going to the bank to open a bank account, to trying to rent an apartment, it makes you grow up because you become your parents' interpreter. And at the same time, you have to help them navigate a system that to all of us was, of course, very foreign. But at least I spoke some English to be able to help them out a little bit. So what was it like seeking asylum in the, in the United States? It was stressful. I think it was that journey that helped me realize that this is what I wanted to do for a living. We were very lucky that a nonprofit organization helped us out. We were helped by Catholic Charities. But interestingly enough, we had our interview, our asylum interview, the day after September 11th. So when we were driving to Miami for the asylum interview, 9-11 happened and we were actually, we were playing music. And then when we got to Miami, my dad started playing the radio and we started hearing everything that was going on. And of course, all the sorrow, the, mm -hmm. the panic of the moment. And we really thought this is it. This was the end of our journey. We didn't even think they were going to take us in or even hold the interview. And they did, uh, which is today so surprising to me that wow. the government office opened and we had our interview and, and thankfully we were granted asylum. So, so it was very stressful times, but again, it was that journey that helped me realize that this is what I wanted to do for a living. And so what was it like growing up in Colombia? It was fun. I have a big family. I have a lot of cousins and uncles and aunts and um, my grandparents. But of course, when you grow up in that environment, you just learn how to deal with everyday violence with everyday insecurity. I remember growing up, for example, it was the time of Pablo Escobar and the bombs and you still live your life. I remember, for example, during the time where the cartels were putting the bombs in Colombia and Bogota in the city where I grew up, um, my mom decided to put tape on the windows in case because of the bombs, the glass were to shatter. Mm -hmm. So she would put tapes on the windows. So in case there was a bomb on the glass shatter, that the glass wouldn't go all over the place. But we would still go to school. We would still go to work at school. They would make us plan in case of a bomb. But you still live your life. You just learn how to deal with it. I remember when we would go to the malls, they would have sniffing dogs. 
and they would check the cars, security would check the cars underneath to make sure that there were no bombs. But again, that becomes part of your daily life and you still have to go on and you still have to go to school and meet your responsibilities. But I, I have to say that I had a very good childhood. I had a very good upbringing. I think the difference, there's a lot of differences between my country and the United States, but it's a very close tight community. You grow up among family and friends and it's a very family oriented culture. Mm -hmm. So I would see my extended family every weekend and then we would make Sunday lunch and we would all get together. My uncle and aunt lived a couple blocks away and I would go ride a bike to see my cousins every day. So that was one of the most shocking parts of living of leaving our country and coming to the United States was how isolated it felt at the beginning. I think, although of course it's still a very family oriented country, it's not as open, I would say. I think like that was one of the first shockers was to see how alone it felt. When we first moved here, I would ask my parents, like, where's all the people? Like you wouldn't see people on the street. That to me was just so surprising. And now I know wow. because of the heat, everyone just stays inside. It's so hot. But <laughs> I was just used to seeing people on the street and, and we didn't see that when we moved here. So you practically grew up in a pretty high risk environment, just bombs and, and just knowing at the back of your head that this is all going on. But you mentioned you, you just had to live your life and that that to me is pretty crazy. Yeah, it is. And now that I look back on it, it's, it is. And the insecurity, uh, I remember, for example, there was a time in Bogota where there were different ways where people would rob you and you just had to be very aware of your belongings and wear your purse on the front. And But you just learn how to deal with it. And, and that becomes your reality and it becomes everyday life. And you, you know not to wear certain things, not to go into a certain part of town. But it doesn't seem odd when you live in that environment and you grow up in that environment. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. So tell me a little bit about the struggles that you had to go through when you first immigrated. And I know you mentioned a few, but tell me a little bit more about that. Well, for me, I was it, I was 16 years old. I had in Colombia, we don't have separate schools for elementary, middle school and high school in Colombia. You go to school with the same people from age five until you graduated from No elementary. way. Yeah. So oh. for me, it was to leave all of that, all my friends and family and to know that we didn't know when we were going to see them again. We couldn't go back. So that was the hardest part. And then adapting to a whole new culture, especially because, of course, I didn't want to be here. So that to get adapted to a new country and make new friends and explain to people where I came from. I When I moved to the States, I moved to a small town called Largo by Clearwater. And there was only one other Hispanic girl that I knew. I mean, there was probably more, but in my class, there was only one other Hispanic girl. And it was a small town. So I don't think that there, it wasn't very diverse. So I had a lot of questions about where I came from and whether I, <laughs> kids would ask me if I used to live in a house or did I used to live on a tree. And if, yes, like if we had cars in Colombia or if I got here on a boat and Oh my goodness. So it's, I don't think it's cruelty. It's things they just don't know, you know, they just don't know about any other country and what it actually is like. So mm -hmm. at the beginning, I was very offended by those questions. And, and, you know, Colombia's fame is about drugs. So a lot of people would ask me about drugs and whether I sold drugs or whether my family sold drugs. So that was difficult at the beginning, yeah. getting used to all of that. And then helping my parents because a lot of things you take for granted, for example, just having credit in order to rent an apartment or learning to get around and trying to find a job when you don't have a network of people to help you out, it can be very difficult. So going through that process with my parents was very hard, but I, I'm, I'm grateful that we went through all of that. I think it made us grow closer as a family. Yeah. yeah. And at 16, you all of a sudden became 21. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Overnight. <laughs> yeah. You had to help 
my parents with everything. But we were lucky that we had, when it came to an apartment, we were having a very hard time finding somebody to rent an apartment because we had, my parents didn't have a, a job history in the States. They spoke very little English. They didn't have a credit history. So we found this Canadian couple that to this day, and I'm so thankful that they just out of the goodness of their heart and just because they trusted us, decided to rent an apartment to my parents. And they were so kind. And that first Christmas we had here in the States, they bought us presents and they bought a little Christmas tree for us. And then every year they would do that for us. And I really hope I wish they were there right now because they really made a difference in our lives. So they helped you out to get an apartment? Yeah, they actually owned the apartment, but nobody Uh, wanted to uh, rent to us because we didn't have a credit history or an employment history. They decided to just go out on a limb and rent the apartment to us. And they helped us out in terms of not asking for the first and last month. They just asked for a small security deposit and that was it. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so nice of them. So what type of jobs did your parents take? Well, when we first got here, my mom is a dentist in Colombia and my father was a business owner. But of course, neither one of them spoke English. My dad spoke a little, very little English, but my mom spoke no English. So when we first moved here, my dad just found odd jobs. He worked everywhere from a car wash to a restaurant. My mom first found a job at a rental car place and she was there for some time. Eventually mm-hmm. she was able to get some of the credits from her degree in Columbia County and she was able to get a title as a dental assistant. And she worked for many years as a dental assistant for the Florida Health Department. And then she actually just retired and she's helping me out with my baby. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. Perfect yeah. timing. <laughs> yeah. So Camila, before you tell our listeners about your company, you tell me a little bit about the path you took. And I'm interested to see if you went into any other fields before starting your business. Well, I knew from that experience, I wanted to practice immigration law and I wanted to somehow pay it forward. So my dream was to work for a nonprofit organization like Catholic Charities and to help other immigrant families come to the United States and start a life here. So I went to law school and when I first graduated, I couldn't get a job in a nonprofit. So I took a job with a private firm here in Orlando practicing immigration law. We also practice family law, but I I learned very quickly that that was not the field for me. Um, I didn't really enjoy it. And I was there for approximately almost three years. And then a position opened at the local legal aid office. So I took that position and I was with them for another three years. And I loved the job. I still am very close to my legal aid family. As a matter of fact, I'm now on the board of legal aid. But then the issue with legal aid was that since they work based on funding, they really limit the types of cases that you're able to take. So after a while, I it started getting a little bit repetitive. I wanted to do, for instance, deportation work, but the number of hours that you put into a deportation case You can do several cases, for example, for victims of domestic violence. So the legal aid Mm. was not able to do deportation cases. So I decided to go off on my own at that point. And it was a leap of faith because I came from a nonprofit. I didn't really have a, a book of business. I was single at the time. So either I I had to make it. (laughs) There was no plan B. (laughs) So I decided to take the jump. My business, I originally started it with two business partners and we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to have a law firm that exclusively concentrated on, on immigration law. And then after some years with them, we decided to go our, our separate ways and I started my firm business completely on my own. It's going to be three years ago now. Well, a little bit over three years now. Wow. Um, That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that journey. So I have a few follow-up questions for you. So how old were you when you first started that immigration firm with the partners? 
I was 30. 30. And then a couple of years later, you started on your own? Yes. So it must have been like 33. Yes. <laughs> okay. Got it. Got it. And then tell me a little bit about your education. So out of high school, did you go and get your JD right away or did you take some time? No, I, after high school, I started with my bachelor's, but I knew I wanted to go to law school. But for my bachelor's, I did political science and international studies. I went here in Orlando at the University of Central Florida, and then I graduated and I got into law school at the University of Florida where I got my my JD. Got it. Got it. And then right after that, you just shared all the experience that, that provided you to that journey for Capella immigration, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> just wanted to put all the pieces together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about Capella immigration. What cases do you guys mainly focus on? What is the main focus and what do you guys practice? So we practice immigration law exclusively. Uh, we do all kinds of immigration cases. So we do everything from family petitions, citizenship cases, deportation defense. Uh, we also do investor visas. We do employment visas, work visas. So we handle, again, exclusively immigration law, but everything within immigration. And everyone on my staff, I, I really try to have that connection with immigrants. So every single person in my staff has an immigrant connection. So my associate is from Jamaica. My receptionist is from Ecuador. My paralegal, she was born in the United States, but her parents are Cuban and Ecuadorian. Because I think it does make a difference when you have gone through the process or when you have family members, close family members that have gone through the process, it helps you relate with the clients. And if you know what they're going through and how stressful it is and and the difference that you're really making in people's lives, I think it makes you that much better at your job. All the listeners that are listening to you are immigrants. So this is definitely going to resonate with them. And I wanted to ask you, why does it take so long for the United States <laughs> to process immigration papers and get it all finalized. I mean, I tell you, I I came here when I was four, so I, I can't resonate with the process because my parents did that. But I hear people, it takes over 10 years and I'm reading through news articles. Some people just give up and they move to Canada. Like, yeah. why is it forever and such a brutal process? It is. And, and the worst part is that it's only getting worse. Under the current administration, we have seen the backlogs tripled. So cases that before the current administration would take a year are taking a year and a half, two years. The immigration system in the United States, it's broken. There's just no other way around it. Right. The red tape around it how difficult it is, how complicated it is. And we're losing talented people. I mean, just to give you an example, thankfully things are changing for them. But for the dreamers, these are people that were brought to the United States as kids. A lot of them are professionals, are business owners, are people that know other country than the United States. And they have been educated in the United States. And because of their current immigration status, they don't have a way to getting a legal permanent residence and really moving forward in their career and their professions. But even then, it's people that, again, are starting businesses that are crucial employees for very important multinational companies. And because of that, we're losing them. There's like this movement for dreamers to actually go to Canada, as you mentioned, because they're welcome there, which is a shame. But I mean, I don't want to get political, but I'm hoping that things Will, will be different starting next year because it has the, the immigrant community has really suffered the last four years. Yeah, I feel so passionate about immigrants. And like you said, they're so talented. You know, they come from amazing families. They come here educated. And then I hear them saying, well, you know, through the process, I wasn't able to work. So people are following the law. People are following the rules and they're clearly just sitting home, not able to take a paycheck for the dream of living in the United States, for the dream of just being here in a country of freedom. And then they're stuck in this brutal process. To me, I feel like your work is so, so 
powerful. So that's amazing that you guys are taking these cases and turning the lives around for all these immigrants. And thank you. Thank you so much for what you do. So are you guys nationwide? Do you guys take someone calls from Sacramento says, I need help? Will you guys yeah, take yeah. this? Yeah. Yes, we do. I mean, immigration law is federal law. So it's the same thing nationwide. We do have cases from different parts of the country. We do take cases from all over the country. Most of the times, the way it happens is that people retain us here and then they end up moving somewhere else. But for the employment-based cases, or for example, we've got, when a company here in the United States wants to sponsor an immigrant, those cases, we've had some companies out of state that want to go through the process. And, and now with technology, it's we can really do anything. It's as if you have the person here in town and with video conference and email and signing. It's just, it's really easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. And what is it like to sponsor an immigrant? It's a very long, complicated process. Yeah. <laughs> With In two words. <laughs> yeah. But it's a process where the company has to show that they have a need for somebody with specific education or experience. And they haven't been able to find somebody with that, with those qualifications who's a permanent resident or a citizen. And that's why they need the immigrant. So the process is made out to protect the American worker, to make sure that jobs are not being taken away from the American worker. And then if the company is able to show that they actually did recruitment, so we have to put ads in the newspaper, online, on the radio and show that the company in good faith tried and they couldn't get any suitable applicants. And that's why they need the immigrant. So it's a complicated process, but we've done so many cases and then you'd be surprised. There's companies that need very specific experience and there's just not that many people out there that meet those requirements. And that's why the company has to pay all this money because it's, a, it's an expensive process. And it's a complicated process and they're willing to do that because these are crucial people for their businesses. And without them, the company would really suffer. Again, so much red tape. Why can't yeah. it be easy? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Anything with yeah. immigration, it's just going to take a while. So what about couples? Like if a couple just wants to sponsor someone out of the goodness of their heart, can they do that? Or does it have to be through a company? Well, the, the immigrant system in the United States is based on family relationships. So the majority of people who immigrate to this country is based on a family member, but there's only certain family members that you're able to sponsor. So you're only allowed to sponsor as a citizen, your parents, your spouse, your children, and that's it. So, and there's different categories depending on whether you're sponsoring a minor child or an adult child who's married. If you're sponsoring an adult child, well, an adult son or daughter who's married, it's going to take years. <laughs> but that's the beauty of the of this country. There's so many people that want to be here that want to move to this country. So as you mentioned, there's people that wait decades mm -hmm. outside of the United States for their turn to be able to come to the United States. But then there's a lot of people that there's just no avenue for them. Uh, you hear a lot in the news and people who don't really understand that they say, well, why can't they just get in line? Well, for a lot of them, there is no line. There is no way of lawfully immigrating to this country. And so that's why, I mean, amongst many other reasons why we have unlawful immigration to the United States, because right. there's just not that many ways to come to the United States lawfully. Right, right. And oh my goodness, I can talk to you about this forever. So, <laughs> okay, so I just want to say one more thing and then we're going to move on. I, I remember my parents, they were telling me about some of the stories that they would hear from their family members about immigration process in, back in Russia. And back in Russia, I guess they, you know, a family would say, okay, we're going to try to go get our papers in Moscow. And it only ha happened in Moscow. So people would, the families would sell all their stuff, pack two suitcases, and go to Moscow to get some papers. And if they were approved, they were on the next flight out to America. They just never knew if they were going to be accepted or not. But all they had was just two suitcases with them. Yeah. And, and it still happens to this day, which is so sad. There's people that go to the embassy and you suggest to them, of course, don't sell anything, don't make any plans and you have until you have that visa in your hands. 
But many people have just such high expectations and they have been waiting for so long that they they still make plans. And after waiting years, they get their cases denied. And a lot of it is unfortunately because of recent changes, the officers just have so much discretion. So you can prepare the best possible case and have all the evidence ready. The bottom line is that the officer has discretion. For example, they have this new rule called the public charge rule that you have to show to the government that you're not going to be a burden to the United States. And they have mm-hmm. some factors, but the officer is supposed to weigh those factors and make a decision whether they think that person would ever become a, a burden to the United States in the future or not. So an officer may think they go, this person may have this health condition. And in my opinion, they will be a burden while the the officer next to him or her may think completely differently. Mm. So they have so much power that it's very frustrating. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. And I'm with you. I hope it gets a lot better. So Camila, how long did it take your business to start seeing some real traction in the beginning stages? I was very lucky, Alina. I didn't want to take out loans to start my business because I had a lot of student debt. I had to pay for my law school on my own. I still have a little bit of debt from undergrad. So I had over a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Interest rates were crazy and Mm -hmm. I just did not want to go into debt any further. So I honestly started with a very small capital, just my computer and myself. Of course, I didn't have any support staff. And the way that I started my business or the way that I started getting tracking for my business is I was very community oriented. So I came, as I mentioned, from a nonprofit background, and I was very used to doing community events and community presentations and working with different nonprofits here in town. And I just continued doing the same thing. I started doing a lot of volunteering work, a lot of presentations at churches and different community events, and I would offer free consultations. I would also volunteer with different organizations. For example, there's an organization called Mi Familia Vota, and they do citizenship clinics. So I would attend these clinics. I would help people fill out their citizenship paperwork. And so whenever they became citizens and they wanted to sponsor a family member, they would remember me and they would call my office and and that's how I started, just word of mouth, because I, I honestly, I did not have a budget to do marketing. So it was just word of mouth. And I mean, the, the, the immigrant community is a very close community and they started mm-hmm. talking. And to this day, the majority of my cases are based on referrals from prior clients. Wow. So you really had to get out there and and do some volunteer work and and build those relationships. That's awesome. So Camila, did you have any mentors that helped you out to start your business? Yes, I had my husband now. (laughs) We We were not together back then. I just knew him and he was a business owner and he really pushed me. He said, yes, you can do it. And it's not easy. But it's not that hard because to me, it was so foreign. My, my dad was a business owner, but in Colombia, not here. I didn't understand anything from incorporating or taxes. And that seems so foreign to me. And to this day, that's always been the hardest part about the job. The administrative part and the managing part has always been the hardest aspect of owning a business. But there, I also was very lucky to get help from a local organization. It's back then it was called the Hispanic Business Initiative Fund. It is now called Prospera, which gives grants to Hispanic immigrants or just Hispanic background, people who are interested in starting their own businesses. So you go and they give you different grants depending on where you're at. So they gave us a grant, for example, for marketing. So they help us create a logo. They help us create a website, a very basic website. And then they helped us learn how to do QuickBooks and just those beginning steps that you really need to have to be able to start a business. They were instrumental for us. And then after that, then you just start growing and (laughs) taking more classes and seminars and trying to to get more organized to be able to grow your business. What was that organization called again? It's a HBIF. It's a Hispanic Business Initiative Fund. Okay. But they changed their name and it's now called Prospera, which Got is it. to prosper in Spanish. 
Wow. Fabulous. And uh, they just serve the local community in Florida? They do. I know they have different offices throughout Florida, but I think it's only a, a Florida organization. Awesome. Well, that's really amazing that you found them and they were able to help you out. So that's that's awesome. Yeah. So uh, looking back at your immigrant entrepreneur career and knowing what you know now, would you want to change anything or do anything differently? I would tell people to trust your instinct in terms of the staff that you have. For me, it was very important to have a good work environment because I, in the past, I've had environments I didn't feel comfortable in. Unfortunately, in the law firm environment, a law firm can be a very stressful place to work at. And I knew from the beginning, I, I didn't want that. I wanted to be happy when I go to work, but I also wanted my people to be happy myself. So it's, for me, one of the hardest parts have been finding the right people to be in the bus with you. It's not only about work ethic, but I think it's a lot about personalities. It's a lot about the way you see the future. And you have to find people that are passionate about the work that you do because it's still going to be stressful. The last four years, again, have been very stressful for immigration practitioners. So if you don't love what you do, I think things can get very messy. So I had situations in which I kept on people that perhaps were not a good suit for the job because I am not, I don't like confrontation. So the thought of having to let somebody go was just too much for me. But I knew from the beginning, like for certain people, they were just not the right fit. And, and if, if I were to trust my incident, if I would have acted upon that from the beginning, it would have saved me a lot of headache. So even though you're somebody that perhaps you don't come from an entrepreneur family, you've never been in the business environment before, I would say trust your instinct, trust that God, because many times you're going to be right. And for mm-hmm. me, it took a long time to really trust myself and to and to feel comfortable in my own skin and to just know that I know what I'm doing and I'm doing what I think is best for my business. Such powerful advice. Thank you. Thank you so much. (laughs) So let's talk a little bit about successes. Are there any successes that you would like to outline from your immigrant entrepreneur journey? For me, first of all, I had my associate became pregnant. It's going to be two years now, but the ability to offer paid maternity leave was huge for me because I know I wanted to do that and I was able to do that and it felt it felt great. Um, because then now that I became a mom, also the ability for me to step away from my business and be able to enjoy those first couple of months with my baby, knowing that I have a structure in place and I have the right people at work that I can count on them and that I know that my business will continue running and, and that it's going to be successful and I can still have that work-life balance. It's not easy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was very, very nervous to step back because I can be a control freak. Yeah. <laughs> so to be able to step back and to know that it's going to be okay. And after that first couple of weeks that I saw that everything is fine, the business is running and clients are happy and really allowed me to take that time with my baby. And to me, that was a great success. Yeah. And providing paid maternity leave. That's amazing. So thank you for doing that. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, Camila, what's next for you? What are some business goals for the next couple of years? Well, like any other business, we still were pretty affected by COVID. We saw significant decrease in the business. Uh, We had to change the way that we were doing business. We had to, of course, move to an all digital platform. And Mm -hmm. some of our clients, like I said, I I handle all types of cases from investors, people of extraordinary abilities to the farm workers. And a lot of them, they just don't have the resources. They're not very tech savvy and it has been very difficult on them. And that, of course, has affected the business. So Now I want to concentrate on revamping the business, on trying to get on in this new COVID time and finding new ways to generate more business, to keep growing under the current environment. Because as I mentioned, 
to me, the best way to market has been getting out on the community, doing presentations, doing events. And now with COVID, we can't really do that. So I've been trying to find other ways to keep growing the business, start to grow in that presence online. I want to start using social media a little bit more as a way of replacing that contact with the community and uh, try to do that through, through social media. And so, Camila, uh, what does the American dream mean to you? The American dream means to me the ability to do what you want and make a living out of it and really have the life that you have imagined. I think the beauty of this country is that you can have a very good living doing something that you love. I come from a country that many times in order to be successful, you have to follow a certain path and you have to be either a doctor and be a professional in certain areas and think, although I'm a lawyer and traditionally people think of lawyers as people of money, but for example, in my business, when I started, I had so many attorneys tell me, there's no way you're going to survive only practicing immigration law. Immigration law is not a field that is going to generate a lot of money. You need to start doing personal injury or another type of law that will generate the revenue mm -hmm. so you can actually do what you like on the side. And I have found that that's not the case. That That's the beauty of this country, that if you're passionate about something, you can really make a living out of it and you can have that dream job and you can really enjoy what you do and have a good living. And there's so many immigrants that are looking for help. So yes. <laughs> you are definitely changing the world with that. So keep it up. Keep up the really Thank good work. <laughs> so I want to wrap up with some super, super fast questions, if that's OK with you. Yeah. What time do you normally start your day? Well, things have changed now with the baby. <laughs> now yeah, it's yeah, very, yeah. Very early. Um, now with the baby, I usually am up by five because I try to feed her and get her ready before I have to go to work. But at the same time, I work five minutes away from my house. So I'm able to come home and feed her during my lunch break and then go back to work. Nice. That's so convenient yeah. for you. <laughs> How many employees do you have? I have three employees. Okay. How often do you watch TV in a week? Now with the baby, it's honestly never. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have my guilty pleasures that I, I watch with my husband. For example, right now we're watching that British baking show. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's my guilty pleasure. So we try to watch it every other day. Love it. Love it. And the last one is how many hours of work do you normally put in, say, in a week? Again, with the baby, everything has changed. Before the baby, I can tell you that I was putting 60 hours, 70 hours a week. Now, I really concentrated on doing that hard work before the baby was here. So now I can have a little bit of work-life balance. Right now, I can tell you that I'm working the 40 hours and I'm really trying to stick to those 40 hours so I can, because my baby really needs me at this stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So important. Awesome. Well, Camila, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. What you're doing out there is powerful, is amazing, and it's transforming the lives of immigrants. So thank you for the work that you do. And I truly, truly wish you all the best of luck and best of successes. And thank you again for coming on my show. I hope to connect with you in the future. Yes, Alina. Thank you so much for having me. This, was, this has been great. Alrighty, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a rating wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.